Yeah. First, I just want to reiterate, it's as safe as sleeping. There's no dangers of getting possessed or going locked out of your body or getting lost or anything like that. You have a spirit guide. You're protected. There's a silver cord. You're fine. I would also say that there's, there's only four obstacles to people doing this. One is plain ignorance. They don't know. You have no idea that you can even do this. Another is fear. Fear can be a big barrier. Another would be uh, laziness. Like you may know it, but, but you're not putting the steps forth. And another would be skepticism. I don't think I can do it. You can. Those are the four obstacles. And that's the only thing preventing you from doing this. So it's all on you. And the steps are super easy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, again, we have Preston Dennett with us, and I'm always thrilled to be able to speak with him. He's a fountain of knowledge in so many areas. And just a little background on Preston. Um, you have a very impressive background, of course. You um, are an investigator of UFOs and the paranormal. And I believe you've done this since 1986, correct? All right. You also are a field investigator for MUFON, a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and the author of over 30 books now, right? That's right. Great. So just for folks that may not know you, let's fill in the blanks with maybe some things that I left out that you think are essential for people to know about you, and then I'll get started on the questions. All right. I mean, one thing I do like to make a point of is I did enter this field as a skeptic. I was very scientifically minded, kind of a materialist even. Didn't believe in life after death, ghosts, UFOs, none of it. That all changed in 1986 when I heard a report in the news about a sighting and talked to my brother about his own sighting. And that's what got me kind of into this field, which branched out into the paranormal pretty darn quick because it's all connected. And it wasn't long after that that I started having my own experiences and had some prior to this, but I kind of like pushed it away or debunked it myself. <laughs> I debunked my own experiences <laughs> or tried to, you know, explain them away. So yeah, it, my life took a left turn in the twilight zone at age 21. I'm fortunate. <laughs> I was pretty young. <laughs> yeah. That's a so, great way to put it. <laughs> but yeah, five brothers and sisters, most who thought I was, well, not most, at least a couple thought I was going off the deep end, <laughs> but I taught them. <laughs> they learned I'm soon sure enough. You did. <laughs> That's great. Um, you've written so many books and there's so many more that I want to talk to you about. But today we're going to talk about your book called Out of Body Explorations, right? Yeah. So exciting. Um, when you first mentioned that you have had them for quite some time, I knew we had to share this information with folks. So let's start with your first um, OBE which you state in your book began on October 14th of 1984 with a phone call, right? Right. Well, that's when this whole adventure really started to unravel. And it was the most devastating phone call of my life, for sure. Uh, I was alone in the house, which is so unusual with, you know, six kids in the family. And we've all got friends. But for some weird reason, I was alone. Got the call that my mom had passed of a massive heart attack at age 49. Uh, they didn't want to tell me. You know, I'm 18 years old or so, 19, actually. And I'm like, listen, you have to tell me. I'm 19 years old. Tell me what's wrong. And got that news, which, as you can imagine, is absolutely tragic. And that's when weird events started to happen not long after. I mean, that morning, I woke up in the best mood ever. I remember turning to my sister Valerie, like, gosh, I'm, I'm in such a good mood. Uh, she had died that morning. We didn't know it. She was out of town. So that was kind of weird. And it was two weeks later or so, we had a, a service for her at a friend's house. And we're all up there gathering. And my dad drives up. And I see my mom sitting in the front seat, front passenger seat. And I'm thinking... You know, what's what's going on here? 
I've clearly lost my mind. I am seeing things. I'm hallucinating. But he drove right up next to me, and she's standing or sitting there in the seat. She has a very good posture. She's a very elegant woman. And she was standing in the, or sitting, sorry, in the way she would normally sit. Full color. I mean, I'm looking at her. But the problem is I've got a people on either side of me, and they're not reacting. Because I'm looking at them, I'm like, are you not seeing this? And they weren't. So I didn't say anything. And I just thought, you know what? I am delirious with grief. This is what's happening here. I didn't think ghost or spirit. I Now, now I do in hindsight. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that she was there. Uh, and that's following that. And the next year, 85 and 86, I started having these dreams where she would come into my room. Now, I didn't know... What was going on here either because I would wake up in bed when she walked into my room and she would smile and look at me and try to tell me that she was fine and that you know I need to be okay because she's okay and then I would wake up for real so these were false awakenings these were pretty lucid or even lucid dreams but of course I didn't believe in life after death however on some level I knew for sure this was her there's just something about the quality of a person's presence that when you're in their presence, you know. So I was kind of at a crossroads. I thought, well, either I'm going crazy or there is life after death. Something's going on here and I need to make up my mind because this happened over and over and over again. You know, it hit us all really hard. Uh, but I have to say, I, I was hit particularly hard by her loss. I would you know, go to bed crying and wake up crying. I was absolutely depressed about this. It took me years, honestly. I mean, I wasn't getting over it, is what I'm trying to tell you. I was just having a real hard time with this. And that's when I started picking up books on dreams. Because I'm like, well, maybe some of these dream books can help me. They didn't really. A lot of these books are all about dream symbols and so I started, I wrote on every dream I've ever had. <laughs> I started just doing firsthand field work on dreams. And I asked all my brothers and sisters, tell me every dream you've ever had. <laughs> and all friends, you know, I started really doing studying on dreams. And I learned a whole lot on just dreams. But then I found Robert Monroe's book. Thank you, Robert Monroe. <laughs> um, his book saved my life, really. Uh, Journeys Out of the Body, I think it was called. He wrote Far Journeys and the Ultimate Journey as well. All highly recommended, but his book was all about his own experiences, going out of body, following a heart attack, and experimenting with sleep learning and anesthesia. He started having these uh, astral projection experiences. And reading his book it was very interesting because he was clearly honest very sincere. It was a true adventure story. I thought, wow, this is amazing, because he gave exercises on how to do it towards the end of his book. I thought, you know what? This sounds a little scary <laughs> to me, <gasps> but if you can actually do this yourself, and he said you could, uh, it's worth trying. So as I had been trying to do, I had lucid dreaming at this point with not a whole lot of success really no success, I should say. I read Stephen LaBerge's book, Lucid Dreaming, which I loved. I still have it. But I just wasn't getting there. And so I was doing his exercises, which we can get into if you want. Uh, but they're basically relaxation exercises, both mental and physical, visualizations, this sort of thing. I refined them to find out what works best for me after reading a bunch of other books and having my own experiences. So I started basically meditating each night uh, for a good hour. I mean, I was gung-ho at this. And immediately, that first week, my dream recall doubled, tripled. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> and started getting really vivid. And I remember, here, I'll give you an example. Because a lot of these books, they just dive off into the deep end. I'm like, here, you're having out-of-body experiences. It's so easy. There's a process. And I wanted to lead the people through this. And I had this dream once. <laughs> but what happened is actually I was, I woke up in the middle of the night and I found myself lying on the kitchen floor 
with my head stuck under the cabinet. And I woke up and I pulled my head out and I stood up. I thought, what the heck? How did I fall asleep on the kitchen floor? This is impossible. I was very tired and I could just barely make my way back into bed. And I threw myself into bed and boom, woke up. I thought, oh, you know, I was not sleepwalking. I was, that was an out-of-body experience. I just didn't quite snap to it. So that was a pre-OBE. But the first one came, which is so interesting because I wasn't, it wasn't at night actually, when is, which is when I have most of my experiences when I'm in bed and sleeping and so forth. I had laid down, it was the middle of the day, went into my room feeling a little depressed, laid down on my stomach, and immediately my body started buzzing like it was electric, electrified. In fact, I thought I was being electrocuted. Now, Robert Monroe says, you know, you want to relax to the point where you feel what's called the vibratory state, which is like a mild electric shock. Well, that's not what I felt. I felt, Carolyn, like I was being electrocuted to death, is what I thought. And I, and I thought, honestly, I'd stuck my finger in the light socket next to my bed. So this is what's going on in my head. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is horrible. What is going on? When pop, I flew out of my body out of control, crossed the room, through the hallway, into the bathroom, assumed a vertical position, and looked in the mirror while I'm grabbing the counter, and there's nobody in the mirror. And that's when I knew right then and there, I'm out of body. There is life after death. This is real. Anybody can do it. This is amazing. And I got so emotional that I instantly got pulled back into my room. I'm now assuming a horizontal position, <laughs> And there's some darn person in my room. I can see him, her, I don't know. It was a very shadowy, blurry figure, quite short. Uh, you know, I'm five, nine and three quarters. This person was probably five feet, if that. And I'm trying to get to them. And I can't do it because I pulled right over my body and I plump right back in. Plunk. And I wake up. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I was, my mood went 180 degrees. I was so happy. I did it. I discovered a whole new world. I'm like, I'm going to do this again. Now, at this point, I'm still pretty young. I'm like, gosh, 21, 22. I'm going through this whole UFO thing. Already people think I'm crazy <laughs> in my family. So I'm not really speaking about this to people at first. Uh, because it was a lot for me to take. And I knew that they would not understand. I very quickly did, but I didn't tell anyone what happened. Uh, but I'm like, I'm going to try this again. And mind you, I'm going to college at this point, and I'm kind of working pretty much full time. So I don't have a whole lot of free time. I'm exhausted. Yeah. I'm, you know, thank thankfully I'm young, so I've got lots of energy. But I'm very busy at this point. And, and also, you know, trying to do writing because I was trying to be a writer at a very young age as well. So I could only really do this on weekends. And what, what I would do is I'd sleep late on you know Saturday and Sunday. And next weekend, same darn thing happened, right? Exactly the same. It was the early, early morning and I suddenly felt the vibrations and flew out, crossed the room into the bathroom, got excited, got pulled back in. Third time, I woke up in the middle of the night very disoriented, standing next to my bed. I was so dizzy. I was had major vertigo. And I'm kind of just trying to orient myself. And finally, I, I calmed enough down. I'm like, okay, I'm awake. I'm standing next to my bed. And I looked down on bed, and it's pretty dark, but you can see, you know, enough. See that there I was under the covers. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. And this time I wasn't excited. I was horrified. Because I thought I died. I thought I was dead. Yeah. And there's a kind of a cold dread that, that swept over me that I've never experienced before or since. I've never felt that kind of fear. It was magnified. And uh, I was so afraid that I dove right back into my body. And it was so weird. Cause it felt like I was a jello mold trying to squeeze in. And I'm putting my arms down my sleeves. Wow. My, yeah. I'm trying to fit back into my body. Yeah. 
and I had to really kind of work my way in and I did it and it clicked and I woke up and I almost forgot that that had happened. Cause I'm lying there like something just happened. What just happened? Why did I wake up? Cause it was real quick. And then I did remember, I'm like, Oh, okay. I wasn't afraid at this point. Cause I had become convinced really early on that there's no danger to this. This is not something you need to fear. And I learned quickly, we all do it every night. Uh, there's no danger of getting locked out or possessed or going too far out or yeah. getting lost or all the things that are in some of these early books. Which are legitimate fears. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, are they? <laughs> I don't have any good examples of any of that happening. And I've scoured the literature. I mean, I've got every book I can find on this subject. But certainly, yeah, those things did cross my mind because some yeah. of the books do talk about this. Oh, yeah. So that's how it began for me. Those were the first three. And following that, I would do it pretty much every weekend. So you were in total control of when you decided to have this OBE. Kind of. I wouldn't say I could snap my fingers and go out. But I was doing the exercises enough that they were working. It took me a month and a half. That's all. Not even two months before I had my first OBE. And I wouldn't say I could was in complete control because I would pop out. And this went on for a full year. <laughs> this was so annoying. But don't, don't get me wrong. It was absolute great fun. I'd pop out. I'd be like, yeah, I did it again. And get so happy that I go whoosh right back in. And I was having a dozen or more one to five second OBEs. Wow, that's of, quick. That's Yeah. And it was frustrating because I couldn't, I didn't understand what was wrong. And I learned that it was my strong emotion that was pulling me back. The astral body is also called the desire body or the emotional body. And you learn this when you pop out because your emotions come roaring at you. <laughs> And for a lot of people, it's fear. It can be excitement. It can be lust. It can be hunger, gl gluttony. I mean, it can be laziness even. You can overcome with tiredness. It's really weird. After, these, during, or before? During. During. Yeah. So these, it's, you You really get a sense of it once you do it. But yeah. it's, it's, I wish someone had warned me a little bit <laughs> that these really strong feelings would be coming at me so hard. You know, I'm not an angry person. I, I It takes a lot to get me super angry. <laughs> yeah, no, you seem but, that way. Yeah, I mean, for, for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, but I would pop out sometimes and I would get lividly angry. And I would, this was a little bit later on. I'm, I'm jumping ahead because that first year was really just a matter of let's be calm. And finally, after I don't know how many tries it took me, 20, 50. I just, I said, okay, calm down. You're good. <laughs> Relax. What would you be angry at? Did you know? Or was it just an emotion? Just an emotion. Just I had an no, emotion. No, no reason to be angry. Uh, but once I got myself to where I could stay out a minute or two, I'm like, okay. Yeah. I would I would wake up and I'd be floating in the middle of my room like a spider. And I'd be like flapping my arms and I couldn't move. And I was having a lot of trouble seeing. So I had to master that. And I finally learned that it's willpower, it's attention. It's your, I don't know how else to put it, but willpower that allows you to move. You intend to do it. And boom, I went across the room. I'm like, ah, there we go. <laughs> I figured it out. And it was so cool because you just zoom right across. Yeah. And then I'm like, and, you know, I slept with my door closed, you know, six kids. We all closed our doors at night. And uh, walked right through the door. It was so cool. Out into the living room and everything is so different. I mean, it's this, it looks the same, but everything's slightly glowy, slightly ethereal looking and really beautiful. And I would fly up through the roof of the house and I'd hover about 100 feet above, just soaking in this unbelievable beauty. I lived in a very rural area with lots of trees and yeah plants. yeah we had a eucalyptus tree which was like 200 feet <laughs> well 100 feet 
big, huge, huge tree. And I'd fly up to the level of that tree <laughs> and just look down and kind of fly around the field behind the house and getting used to just doing it. I mean, it, I started in the house, then got the courage to go outside of the house and just went farther and farther and was able to lengthen my ability, sharpen my vision. You know, I am slightly nearsighted, but out of body, you can see things so good. Wow. Did you set the intention for where you wanted to go before you went to sleep or during the experience? Initially, during the experience, I learned if you set the intention before, you're going to be far better off, far more successful. Uh, because it's a very delicate state of consciousness. And if you think it, it's going to direct you that way. Uh, right, right. Yeah, that makes so sense. So if you're very focused... It's very much like riding a bike or walking a tightrope or learning it. It's like learning a guitar or something, learning a computer language. It takes effort. It's sure. applied knowledge is all it is. Anyone can do it. You just have to know how to do it. Uh, most people will have an OBE at least once or twice in their lives just spontaneously. And not maybe know that they're having it. or Right. And if you're having flying dreams, that's yeah. probably... OBEs, well, that brings but... me to my next question. What is the difference between a lucid dream and an out-of-body experience? In your book, you go into detail, of course, but for our listeners, because yeah. I've had, I know I've had lucid dreams. I just had one the other night that was crazy. It felt so real. Like when I woke up, I, I had to think for a minute whether that was real or, or just a dream. And I know that those are like what I think are lucid dreams. Tell, tell us more about what the differences are. Well, well most people, when they're dreaming, it's, there's different levels to dreaming. I'll just put a little groundwork here because the lowest level or, of dreaming is basically you're reliving events of that day. You mm -hmm. might have seen a movie and have a dream about it, or you're processing the information you received that day. And right next to that or above it, if you want to look at it that way, is you dream about your psychological state. Usually it's fears or desires. People are working through th this. But right above that is lucid dreaming. And a lucid dream is when you become aware, awake in the dream state. And when I say awake, you're as awake as you are now. Uh, so you're absolutely like walking into a movie set, kind of, into yeah. a movie. And you are actually out of body when this is happening. Oh, is that right? Yes. But the only real difference is, is, when you are having a lucid dream, the environment around you is created by your own thoughts. These are mental projections that you've made, and that's what you're perceiving. Whereas when you're astral projecting, you're perceiving an objective environment. Okay. Uh, but if you're having lucid dreams, you're out of body. You're probably on the up, you know, beyond the what we would call the third dimension. Yeah. Um, they seem so real, though. Like, I dreamt, oh, yeah. and it, it didn't last long, maybe 30 seconds, maybe less. And I dreamt that I was outside in front of my house, and I was looking up at the sky, and it was so blue, like a dark, you know, when it just gets dark out, and there's still that, like, light blue essence in the sky. And I saw these huge craft um, UFOs, and they had brilliantly colored lights, and I saw the shapes and the detail. And when I looked up, I said, I've seen this before. Where have I seen this? And I was trying to figure out where I knew this. And then I, I woke up and I was like blown away. It, it felt so legit. Is that a lucid dream? So we're, they're this close to each other. Yeah. You know, I've had some OBEs and I'm like, is this a lucid dream? I've had lucid dreams like, is this an OBE? It's right. not always easy because they're basically the same thing. There's a lot of discussion about this in the field. Some are like, well, you know, it's a lesser form of an OBE. And some are like, no, it's actually superior. I'm like, well, eh, they're essentially the same thing. Uh, but what if you're in a lucid dream state, what you can do is a few things to see. Uh, you can say all illusion end. And what will happen is like things won't, might start disappearing. <laughs> And you'll find yourself floating in your room instead of the environment that you oh, were perceiving. Like that. Mm. Or you can walk through a wall that can push you right into an OBE. You can start spinning in place, and that will cause the illusion, illusion around you to dissolve. 
or it might not. You might find yourself actually out of body. And yeah, it's absolutely real. A lucid dream looks more real than reality. Mm. And people need to understand that dreams are not ephemeral. I mean, yes, they are, but they're real. They're 100% real. It's a real experience. So don't call it, oh, it's just a dream is mm, not fair. It's because it's a reality. It is, is it a reality, reality that you you you're actually experiencing like as if it were real life. You're just not in in your body when it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. This, you can have a dream and leave it and go back to it. There, yes, I've had, I've had that. Yeah. That's so these crazy. are these are I'm just trying to make the point that, you know, a dream needs to be paid attention to. Because once you start having these experiences, you go up to the next level beyond lucid dreaming, which is precognitive dreaming. And you are visiting, prob I don't know exactly how to put this, but future, you'll see future events that come true. <laughs> Precognition. You will dream events and they will happen. And it's so amazing because you'll be walking around and suddenly, you know, when you become lucid in the, in the dream state, everything sparkles and becomes super vivid and suddenly you're in it. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm lucid, I'm out of body. This is amazing. And you'll be walking along during the day physically when suddenly that same feeling starts to come over you. This is how it happened for me. The air would almost sparkle and be like, oh my gosh, I, I recognize this. Oh, I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. And you'd walk, it's like walking into a dream, but you're awake. <laughs> I call it waking lucidity. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost a, an enlightenment feeling. Mm -hmm. You do know what's going to happen, and it's so cool. It's just another thing people can expect, which you know wasn't really written about a whole lot in these books that I was getting. But yeah, after I started to get good at this, I could control it better. And I'm trying to get to the other side. You know, because I want to see my mom. <laughs> this is why I did it. And it wasn't working. I would pop out of my body. I'd be like, mom, 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 mom. I thought she was going to come right to me because I'm out of body. I'm halfway there. Where is she? I didn't understand it. I was exploring the physical world. And I would go to my family's house, my brother and his wife and, you know, a friend's house. I went to a friend's house in San Diego. <laughs> I'm in L.A., <laughs> He's in San Diego. I went right over the freeway. Zoom. Real fast. I kind of almost teleported. There would be sometimes I'd be meandering along at five or ten miles an hour. I'm like, this is not going to work. Because I, you have this weird little... I had this sort of hourglass in my head that this is, is how far I can last. This is how long I can maintain consciousness. Because wow. it took me a while to lengthen this from a couple of minutes to an hour. I mean, there'd be times I was out all night. So cool. That was pretty rare. It's still rare. Um, but it's absolutely doable. And also, when you're in the beginning, you're like, gosh, is this a dream? You start to really question reality because it's a huge shift in your whole perception of your place in this universe. And I'm like, I need to prove this. I need to find a way to prove this is real. Even though I know it is, I need to prove it. Because I couldn't prove it to other people. I would be I out of body. Ask you that. Have you ever gone to like a friend's house and saw, this is just an example, uh, that they had a yellow tea kettle on the stove and you've never really been in there or noticed it before and then went to that friend's house and saw that? Like, have you ever mm -hmm. done anything intentional like that? Yeah, I was, that's exactly what I was trying to do. So I'd walk around my house, but the problem is I know my house. Right. You know, or my condo. I was living in the condo. And I would go to my brother's house. I know that house really well. You know, I'd sure. visit them weekly and, and I would say, well, you know, is this or there? there? Well, they, and they'd be like, well, yeah, it is. But you know that. when well, it was true. Right. So, and it's hard to focus on really tiny details. It was for me. Some people are really good at this. But finally, I'm in my, you know, I'd moved out of the family home into Canoga Park into a third story condo. And, Canoga Park, California. And I was so good at it at this point, going out quite a bit and uh, popped out and I'm flying around the condo and thinking, you know what? I need to prove no, what, what happened is I'm flying over the cement river <laughs> near my house and I'm going down at a, um, you know, not too far away from my house, but to a place I've never been before because it's off the road and you can't really get to it. Right. And this is a cement river. 
you know, cement encased LA river. And I'm flying along and I stop because I'm, I'm shocked at what I see, <laughs> which is there is a bank of soil on the base of this completely cemented river and grass is growing. And there's bleached uh, seven up cans and some bottles and some trash. I'm like, well, here, here we go. I am projecting because this can't be. This is a cement river. There shouldn't be any grass growing here. Uh, but I know exactly where this is. It's not too far away. I can drive here. So I'm like, this is, I'm going to see this physically, see if this is real. So I quickly flew back and went into my, you know, I float, float over the body and kind of sink into it uh, and uh, woke up and instantly wrote it down because it can zip away like a dream. It's very hard to remember. And this is a big problem with beginners. So I wrote it down and I got my cup of French coffee and I drank it, relishing. The, I'm like, this is going to be fun. <laughs> got into my car and I drove there. It's a short distance. And I'm like, well, this is going to be hard because this is actually off the road and there's a fence and it's, you know, it's city property. So I kind of, you know, broke the law a little bit by climbing over this little fence. It was easy. But down this steep bank and I peered over the edge. I'm like, bingo. There it was. the bleached seven up cans, the oh bank of soil. God. I'm like, I knew this was real. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I, here's my proof because I just needed to know. Of course. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's why I'm like, I'm giving up on this. I want to do more exciting things <laughs> because I was trying all these experiments. I'd read about it in the books and be like, okay, well, they're doing this. Let's try this. I was trying to move objects. I would like set up a pencil <laughs> on its end. on my coffee table and I go out of body and I'd go up to it and I'd try to push the darn pencil over. Never could. Can that be done? Oh yeah. Yeah. So there are people who can absolutely do this. I still have not been able to do it. Uh, but I, I know a couple of people who can, <laughs> uh, and proved it to me as, as well, which we can get into, but Yeah, I'd every love to now hear about and then, that. Every now and then, my mom would suddenly appear. I, I'd go out into the living room. I'd be like, Mom, oh, my God, run up and hug her. And you can only imagine the reunion, you know, because when you lose someone you love, it's almost impossible to get over. You never fully do. Oh, absolutely. Right? Pet or child or parent or yeah. brother or sister or friend. It doesn't oh, matter. I just lost my husband three years ago, so I'm still, you know, deep in, a gr in grievings, you know, so yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I mean, my mom died in 84 and I still have days, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. but there she was and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I'd hug her and, you know, a couple of times we'd sit, sit down on the couch and have conversations, which I mostly didn't remember other than it was about what I was doing and the family and school and, and such. But this wasn't enough for me because I wanted it. I wanted to be controlled. I wanted to go where she was. You know, I know how I'm doing. <laughs> I want to know how she's doing. Weren't you afraid that that would mean death for you? No. No? You never had that concern? I've never had fear out of body. Um, I learned very early on that it's you're not physical. It's the safest sleeping. You have a silver cord. It pulls you back instantly. The real trouble is staying out, not getting back in. Getting out and staying out is difficult. Uh, You will be pulled back instantly if you have fear, any strong emotion. If you even so much as think about your body can pull you right back in. For whatever reason, I didn't have fear. Uh, I don't know exactly why, because some of the books are, were, you know, tried to terrify you. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I've read some terrifying stories about people that have tried that and wasn't always good, but. yeah, I mean, one time, you know. We had telephone wires near our house. I would always fly over them or under them. Um, and you know, reading these books, one guy says, you can fly right through them. I'm like, mm, I don't know. This is a little, Yeah. this is making me nervous. But one day I'm sitting there floating in front of them. Like, let's do this. And I flew right through them. And boy, I got a jolt because it, What did you? it, it lit up. It all it went, and everything lit up. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. I felt that. Uh, but It was, I was fine. It didn't pull you back into your body. You still kept. No, no. Wow. I was getting better and better at this. Yeah.
And so one day, you know, I'm out there flying around and just doing stuff and finding myself in strange places because you can fly just across the ocean if you want, you know, and you come in for a landing, you're like, where am I? <laughs> and I'd come for a landing and it looked like France, honestly, I'm trying to figure, well, actually, here's what happened. <laughs> I woke up, rushed out into my living room and there was a woman there in my living room, mm -hmm. beautiful black woman, young. And she's smiling at me and I'm looking at her kind of side eye. <laughs> I'm like, I know this woman, but I don't, you know, I don't know her, but she looks familiar. And so I rush up to her. I'm like, hey, who are you? And she smiles at me very friendly, grabs my shoulders, spins me around, puts her hand on the small of my back and pushes me through the wall. Kind of rude. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm trying to get your names uh, because it's not, a, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I, I have a spirit guide and they guide me around and they do all this. Not me. I'm alone. <laughs> Took me a while to, you know, she was a spirit guide for sure. Because of what happened next is I go through the wall and I find myself in this courtyard, which there's, you know, a little metal fence and there's tables, a cafe. It looks like France. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, this, where is this? <laughs> this is weird. And I fly up and I'm flying around. And that's when I remember I want to see my mom. So I called out to her. I'm like, mom, 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 mom. I was like, ah, you know, I don't know, 50 times. I'm not going to give up. I'm like, come to me, come to me, come to me. Come to me. <laughs> and she did. And she floated down in front of me and she was young. Uh, you know, I started losing my hair around 24 or so, pretty early. All my hair comes back. You should see. I'm real, I get real buff even to this day. I look good. We all kind of age regress to the age we want to be. And she did too. <laughs> I almost didn't recognize her. I mean, I did instantly, but I'm looking at her like, wow, you look just like Victoria, my sister. She had black hair. No, it was brown. It was shoulder length. And she was very young. I'm like, mom, look at you. And I grabbed her. And we hugged. That was the best reunion ever. Mm. It was so cool. I'm hugging her and I'm hugging her. And she's like, just wait. I got something to show you. Grabs me by the hand. And we're flying along. And then boom, we're in this <laughs> old Cadillac car flying through space. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I look at her and she's like, she was always kind of fun and mischievous and yeah. she wasn't a practical joker so much, but you know, she ha had a sense of humor and, and she kind of looked at me and laughed and we passed through this weird environment, which was just stony hills. And then boom, we pop out into what I now know are what I would call the heavenly realms. You know, if you are a fundamentalist Christian, this is heaven. I'm not religious. I call it the garden realms. It's absolutely gorgeous. This is where we go and we pass on. And there's trees and there's flowers and there's fields and there's brooks and little pathways and benches and the air is sparkling and this, it, you are embraced in love. There's this divine light. Every, there's no shadows there. Not a shadow because everything is self-illuminated. And I cannot express how beautiful it is, but it is. And the greens, the blues, like you were talking, seeing that blue sky, you know, remember how blue? Oh, it's like yeah. that. It's like everything is like mm, electric. And of course, this car is gone and we're just floating above this field. And she takes me by the hand to the edge of the, this forest. And we plop down in this meadow. And I'm like, this is amazing, mom. She's like, yeah, it is. This was not words. She's very telepathic. I knew instantly what she was thinking. And she knew instantly what I was thinking. So there were no words. If she had an idea. I knew it. And she's like, let's go to that river. Or re really a creek. And it was a couple hundred yards away. So we rise up and she flies me to the river. And we come down and she walks into it. Mm -hmm. so, I'm sorry, a little creek, not a river. Yeah. And... uh and I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, come in, come in. I'm like, okay. And I walk in and it's so cool, Carolyn. The water was so cool and silky. It's different. And I pick the hand on, it would be dry. I put it back in, it's wet. It feels wet. But the water has a different quality to it. That's hard to describe. It's very silky and smooth. And just, I don't, I don't know how to put it. It's different. 
and she takes a piece of algae and she throws it at me I'm like mom what are you doing and she, and she does it again i'm like fine game's on and so we kind of you know splashed water at each other and you know i she's my mom i'm respectful she was Right. going all at it through right in my face <laughs> like oh, mom really and i pull it off and i'm clean And so this is what she was trying to tell me. She's like, look, you know, you don't have to worry. And we we got out and I was totally dry and I was so amazed. And she's like, you haven't seen anything yet. Watch, you know, follow me. And this time we just went side by side flying and we hit this veil between the worlds. I don't know how else to put it, but it was like another dimension, a higher dimension. And it was... Uh, Kind of like diving into a pool. Yeah. And suddenly you're out in the air and it's thin, and then you're diving into the water and it's a little bit more energetic, uh, more light. That's the best way I can put it, more energy. And boom, we were in the this crystal realm. It's a real place. I've read about this since then. This was my first experience with it. But it was all crystals, and it was so beautiful. And we come in for a landing and my mom's sitting on a crystal boulder with her characteristic erect posture. She's very elegant, like I said. Really beautiful. She looks like Audrey Hepburn, kind of. She's Oh, a beautiful lady. Yeah. Fair, you know? And that's not just me saying it. She got a lot of compliments. She was a, a beautiful woman. And uh, she's sitting there all elegant, and looking at me, smiling. She had a great smile. And I am, of course, completely dumbfounded. I'm losing my mind because I'm looking around and And my vision went from being a centralized focus, which is, you know, out like that, to 360 degrees. And that was disorienting for just a second. <laughs> and she's watching me play with this because I did. Because you can zoom in. And I, this crystals realm, there's crystal mountains. It's a crystal plain. It's crystal hills like quartz crystal and rose quartz and mostly white. but slight pinks and yellows and, and such. And I, my vision focuses about two miles away and I can see the tiny little pebbles. And I zoom back, I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And she's looking at me, you know, she's up above me a little bit on this boulder and I'm standing next to her, kind of looking up at her and she points to the ground. And I look down and she turns it bright orange. With her finger, she's like, Look, and, and there's this orange patch, right, bright orange, about a foot wide. <laughs> and I'm looking at it, and I look up at her, and she says, eat it. Pull down, you know, scoop some up and put it in your mouth. I'm like, no, what? <laughs> Did I hear you? She's like, yes, go ahead, do it. It's okay, I promise, try it. I'm like, okay. So I went down, and I scooped it up, and it's like sand. It's like crystal sand. And I put it in my mouth. <laughs> And I don't know if you've ever had Pop Rock candy. Oh, yeah. It goes, chung, 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 chung. Right, right. <laughs> That's what it did. It started sizzling and popping in my mouth, and it tasted orange, like orange juice. But, you know, 10 times more orangey than any candy or orange juice you've ever had. It was like an astral orange. I don't know. How, this is, again, words fail me. Yeah. On, uh, but I'm like, wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, and... Uh, I'm like, little trick, mom, that's amazing. She's like, ah, eh. you know, she was laughing and just smiling and having so much fun at my own astonishment. And then she, we went back to this garden realm and we sat down on a bench and we talked for 20 minutes. And she's like, really proud of me that I made it this far, that I've done what I've been able to do, you know, with this OBEs, with this astral projection. And, uh, That's basically what we talked about. And I started to feel that pull that you get when you know your time is up. And I'm like, oh, shoot, because I want to stay there. It's the kind of place you would gladly stay. Sure. Uh, but I started to feel an actual physical pull on my body. And she says, look up in the sky. And she spelled out in white fluffy clouds, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh. I'm like, wow. <laughs> wow. You know, she could manipulate the environment really well. I, I've since learned how to do that myself. Anyone can. It's super easy. You just think it. And then this tunnel opens up, like, right behind me to my right. And I look, I'm like, well, there we go. 
whoosh, I'm flying down it. It's the near death tunnel that so many people describe a tunnel of light. And it took a long time to get back to my body. In fact, I stopped a couple of times and wrote down the experience on a dream, dream journal. This is what, I keep a dream journal in the physical world so I could write all this down. But I kept, I'm keeping one on the astral planes too. Because it helps you to remember. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote down, it's a dream, dream journal, if that makes sense. And I had to do that a couple of times. <laughs> Finally, I woke up, I'm like, I, am I actually in my bedroom? <laughs> it took me a second. I'm like, yeah, I, I did it. I did it. And that was the first time of what would be hundreds where I would go up there. And it's so weird, Caroline, because the whole family would be there. My dad, all my brothers and sisters, we'd be doing stuff. We'd come together. We'd sit at a table. And I'd look at my mom. I'd be like, gosh, you know, wh what's going on here? Because <laughs> these were all my brothers and sisters who were still alive. Right. And I would talk to them, and they were like to totally okay. Like, oh, yeah, this is where we live normally. I would be up there so long. There would be times I'd completely forget I was alive on the physical world. I'd be like, oh, well, this is where I live. And then suddenly I'd get this feeling like something's pulling on me. What's happening? What and I'd get, I'd get pulled back. Do you ever back. ask your, your brothers and sisters or your dad if they had dreams like that? Would they remember? Yeah, they weren't. Yeah. Um, a few times. I mean, my brother Stephen once had a dream with my mom and asked her, you know, how are you? What's it like on over there? He's super skeptical. <laughs> And she said, it's very much like here. It's just different. But, you know, I started to get concerned about this. So I'm like, I would have this experience. And I'd go back and I'd call my sister or my brother. I'm like, did you have a dream last night? Because I saw you there. We were on the astral planes. And we're like, oh, you stop talking about your OBEs. I don't believe in this stuff. That's what my brother would say. My sister would be like, oh, that's cool. No, I don't remember. So finally, one day, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confront this. Because my mom and I would, she would share this special connection. Because I'd look at her, I'm like, all oh, these people are asleep. Mm -hmm. They're subconscious astral is what Marilyn Hughes calls, calls them. And we'd share a special bond because she'd look at me and know I'm going to remember. And all these other folks around us are like, dee, dee, dee. they're not remembering. They're not clicking to it. So finally, I confronted Stephen. I'm like, Stephen, do you realize you're out of body right now? He's my older brother, three years older than me. He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, you do? <laughs> okay. I was confused because I wasn't sure you realized. He's like, no, no. I, I know we are. I'm like, oh, well, then you'll, you'll remember this. He's like, no, I'm not going to remember this. I'm like, but how can you say that? How can you say you won't remember if you're rem fully conscious right now? He's like, I just don't have that ability. I'm like, well, I'm doing it. If I can do it, you can. He's like, I'm not there yet. And I, and I started to get angry with him. I'm like, well, of course you can. You know, just all you have to do is try. And he's like, listen, stop it. And I'm like, no, no, you need to. He's like, stop, stop trying to push me. I'm like, fine. He just wasn't course, ready. I guess. Yeah. I called him up. And he's like, no, I didn't have any dreams last night. Oh, my oh, God. <laughs> and so I tried it with Victoria. And, and I'm like, Victoria, do you realize you're out of body? This was another occasion. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, yeah. I call it the in-between place. I'm like, oh, you do? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Uh, so she had even a little bit more awareness of what's going on. And I'm like, okay, well, you'll, will you remember this? She's like, no, I'm not able to remember it. I'm like, okay, here we go again. How do you know this? She's like, I just know I'm not going to remember. I'm not there yet. I'm like, can I try something to make you remember? And she says, sure. And at this point, I was experimenting with creating things. Because you go to the other side and you can create trees and flowers. And wow. I would create my house. I'd create a forest. You can actually create stuff. It's so cool. And I'm, so I took her aside. I'm like, okay, look up in the sky. And I created a UFO. <laughs> ah. You know, I'm all about flying saucers. And I did. It was super shiny silver. And it had colored lights all around it. And it was gorgeous. I did a good job. I may say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> and she's looking up at it and she's like, wow, that's amazing. I'm like, yeah, whoa, look at that. <laughs> I said, do you think you'll remember that? And she's like, you know, I think I might. Nope, did not remember. remember it. So after a couple of attempts at that, I'm like, well, fine. 
I'd be, I'd go out of body and I'd go to their house because it was often early morning and sometimes they'd be awake or I could do it in the afternoon and they would be awake and I'd walk around in front of them. I'm like, hello, 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 hello. <laughs> no, they could not see me. It was really weird uh, and somewhat frustrating. But yeah, sometimes I'd pop over to the other side. This is early on. And like I said, it's the desire body, right? It's the emotional body. And I would become overcome with one emotion or another. And when it was anger, I would create uh, a scene, you know, a mm -hmm. place. Often it would be grocery stores. This is a weird thing that kept happening with me. I'm like, why, the, why am I finding myself in grocery stores? This happens to other people, too. <laughs> this is a thing. I, start, I read with delight several other books where, you know, you might find yourself in a grocery store. So weird. Very weird. I don't know if it's the life force of all the food or what. Yeah. I don't know. But I would get so angry and I'd push the shelves over and I'd clean them and I'd throw things. And, I'd, mm. and if someone came up to me, I'd shove them down. <laughs> I'm like, I must be, you know, Robert Monroe talked about this. He says, sometimes when you're in the out-of-body state, you, you are technically psychotic <laughs> because I think what you're dealing with is just repressed emotions. I don't know precisely what's going on, but it's there's an emotional feedback that can sort of escalate you into extreme emotions. And then I would become, you know, I don't have an eating problem, a food problem. I started to recall past lives and we can get into that. And I, yeah. in several of these past lives, I would die of starvation. So ah. there was a little bit, I, I do keep food in my room, you know. <laughs> I do like food a lot because, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't like going hungry. I hate that feeling. <laughs> Do you think in a past life that that was something that you experienced? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? So there oh, was, was a little coming bit. Of, through. Yeah. You'll find that when you do this work, we all have little phobias, little fears. Oh yeah. In inclinations, desires, eccentricities, foibles. We're drawn to certain things in our dress and our choice of food and our choice of music. And all of these are past life influences to a certain degree. Talents. You know, you might be really good at something uh, because more than likely you were doing this in a prior life. But at any rate, <laughs> I'll go to the other side. And this is the place where people are lucid dreaming and you're creating stuff, which is kind of a, a level. I'm not a, I don't have this mapped out. Right, but it, there is a place, uh, and I would create all this stuff, and I create this feast of food, <laughs> and it was always the same things. I have certain foods that I like. It would always be sour cream and onion potato chips. Oh, I like them too. <laughs> Neapolitan ice cream, chicken nuggets, and brownies, and and a glass oh, of orange juice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love them, and I would gorge. It was so funny because I could take a whole bag of potato chips and eat the whole thing. Ah. And they're crunchy and they taste good and it disappears right about here. Do you <laughs> feel satiated after you eat it or is it not just so much now? No, not so much. You don't get full. No. In fact, sometimes I'd be drinking. I could not slake my thirst. I couldn't do it. And I just take brownie after brownie after brownie and chicken nuggets and I'm gorging uh, on this food. Ice cream, it's funny, it's because I could scoop it up with my hand and it wasn't ice cold. It was it was subtle, subtly cool, but still really creamy and good. <laughs> and yeah, it was not super satisfying, but you it was fun because you could taste it and it had the yeah. textures. And, hey, it's a great way to beat the calories. It was so much fun. Yeah. Finally, yeah. I just kind of grew I, I grew past it. And I'm not gonna get graphic. In this part, but you know, I was also a very lustful person. <laughs> I read that in your I was gonna ask you about that. Tell us. I go, yeah, I go into detail in the book into honestly embarrassing detail, but I figured, you know what, we're all human, we're all That's naked right. under our clothes. We all go through this. <laughs> so why not? Let's just let it all hang out. And I would become overcome with lust. And you know, Patricia Garfield talked about this, Robert Monroe talked about this your you know feelings of lust come real strong and robert monroe would just 
abstain, right? He's like, I'm just not going to do it as long as I can. And he'd come back and, you know, do it with his wife or whatever. I couldn't abstain. <laughs> I couldn't do it. So I just, and some of these were, you know, real people who I think were actual entities and others were mental projections. And honestly, you can have fun with it because it's, you know, fulfill any fantasy you have. You can fulfill it. And I had fun with it. And it was awesome. And I loved it. And uh, Were after... you able to choose the person, like, just by thinking of them? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And uh, I did. You know, I'm not ashamed to say it. It was fun. <laughs> and it's a great... Great way to, you know, do things that you couldn't normally do in real life. Um, you would be considered <laughs> um, a slut. Right, <laughs> right. Which is, you know, fine. I don't judge people. People, I encourage you to, you know, if you really want to do this, go out of body and do this. I encourage you to work through your anger, work through your depression, work through your desires, your fears you confront them while you're in the physical realm you'll have a lot easier time of this because they're going to come at you anyway and it's a great place to work them out too so i would i dealt with those three things mostly gluttony <laughs> anger and lust you know the deadly sins right, right we're all dealing with one you know could be depression for someone sure. it could be greed you know yeah. whatever it is and i worked through it and it was fine and then i got to the more fun stuff because the real fun is on the upper realms and any my our pets passed away right max and clyde and i love them dearly and one day i'm flying around and i get to this place where i know I'm, i meet people because it's very cloudy and white and featureless kind of right above i'm guessing the garden realms and this is where a person will go it's like right, right next to the light that near-death experiencers talk about. And I'm there, I'm like, okay, I'm here. And my dog, Maxine, comes running up to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Maxine was an old dog. She was very dignified. You know, she would say, give me your paw. And maybe she would, maybe she wouldn't. <laughs> she didn't really lick you unless, you know, she, it was a special occasion. <laughs> right. And she comes running up to me and she jumps on me and she's licking me all over the place. I'm like, Maxine, <laughs> wow, you're in a good mood. <laughs> And yeah, over and over again, her son Clyde would come running up to me and we'd have a reunion. And this knocked me over. One time I'm there and she comes running up to me and she says, hi, Preston. <laughs> oh, I've seen you can talk. <laughs> I laughed so hard. Is this telepathic? Uh, yeah, but I heard it all out. Oh, you did. Oh, yeah. yeah. And her female voice. Did she say anything else or just... No. It's high. Mm -hmm. But it's so wild because that's happened a number of times. And I'm reading books like crazy. And I finally found one. I'm like, okay, I'm not the only one who's experienced this. This is a thing. In fact, I have a dog right now, Duchess. And uh, she's alive. But one day she came loping into my room, out of body, woke me up. And I'm out of body now too. And she says, my name is Duchess and I love you. <laughs> she's a smart dog <laughs> it was so funny <laughs> to hear a dog's talk it's it's yeah it's wild. I, I you don't wish expect my dog it. Would talk to me i mean <laughs> i think they communicate and like i i swear i communicate with him telepathically i i do it now i know i do i think yeah. all animals have that ability to do that anyway but yeah there's been studies dogs know yeah. when their owners are coming home oh yeah and I, I did, I experimented with Duchess. I'm like, just come, you know, thinking, think. And she came. Oh, yeah. And sometimes I'll really secretly put out food very quietly. And she's in the other room. She can't smell it. But she comes running. <laughs> yeah, they know. They know. Yeah. So what, what, uh, not that I want to be negative, but what is the scariest thing that happened to you during an OBE? Like something other than what you've mentioned, some things, but was there yeah. a particular event or creature sure. or entity that you didn't know what it was and it frightened you? There's been a couple of, you know, it's overwhelmingly positive, I will say. 
but there are some things that you have to, uh, that were fearful, sure. Uh, like one time I'm trying to go see the Titanic. <laughs> to go back in time, I want to see the Titanic. I've got books on it. I'm all about shipwrecks. I know why now, past lives. Uh, but so I'm going on a body. I'm going to the other side. I'm trying to get back in time, which is you can do, but it's not easy. And I was running out of time. And I'm looking down below me, and there's all these clouds. I'm like, okay, I'm really curious what's down there. Because I'm not, I'm, I don't have time to get to where I'm going. I had about a minute left, I could tell. So I dove down in, through these clouds, and I ended up in this field that looked like Africa to me. And it felt like it was back in time because the plants were huge. And I'm trying to orient myself in time and space. And I can't because it's a natural scene. <laughs> and I'm just looking around me, and all of a sudden I see a it's a, a lion and it's a female and she's in pouncing position about 20, 40 feet from me, you know, with her paws out and her eyes lock on mine. And I'm like, oh, shoot, because she leaps towards me. And in one quick leap, her jaws are around my neck. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that scared the living daylights out of me uh, because I knew my, I'm about to get my, you know, head chomped off. And I quickly left. I mean, that drove me right back into my body. That was scary. And I think it was a past life. Oh, well, there's Duchess. She knows I'm nice. talking about it. So <laughs> um, what do you think? That, yeah, you think it was a past life that was just kind of coming through? And Yep, I do. Uh, I, often what happens, because I started experimenting with past lives. I'm like, okay, let's go to a past life. And every single time I did it, I would be taken to the most emotional scene, the most traumatic scene in that lifetime, which was almost always the death scene. Not always, but... Your death scene? Like mm, when yeah. you... Do oh, no kidding. And which is a thing. You know, I found this out because you carry the trauma and this can cause health problems yeah, even, yeah, right. phobias. I was taken back to the Holocaust. Ooh. And... That was horrific because I was put on a bus. I was a 40-year-old Jewish man. And they took me off the bus and ran me at gunpoint in a line of people right up to this pit. And we had to stand there with people with guns around us. And one by one, we walk up to the pit and they'd shoot us in the back of the head and, and we go. Oh, do you feel the pain of that or is it just the emotion? Just the emotion. Yeah. I didn't feel the pain. And I couldn't get out. I don't know why. I just didn't get out of it because I knew what was going to happen. And sure enough, it did. And as soon as that bullet hit the back of my head, I woke up. Another time, I'm like, take me to a past life. I was on the front porch of my... This is a very early one. I was still in my house in Topanga Canyon, living with my parents and family. I'm like, take me to a past life. And suddenly this screen, like a movie screen, swept towards me at an angle and encased me and swept me up into this scene. And I'm a woman. <laughs> Who's about to be raped and murdered. Oh, jeez. And this guy's coming towards me. I'm like, no, I'm not doing this because I know what's going to happen. And so I did my little trick to get back into my body, which is opening and closing my eyes and wiggling my hands and fingers or my, oh, my fingers and toes. Get back. Yep. So I just didn't want to relive it. Once I was in the uh, slavery times, I was... Uh, this is one of the few that wasn't a death scene. <laughs> I was a 15-year-old boy who had run away and got caught. And they locked me in this room of this southern mansion. Mind you, I lived in a hut with no floor. They, I mean, they barely fed you. It was a one-room dirt floor. And they, I, had, I was the oldest. There was four kids below me and my mom. Mm. And uh, I'm finding myself in this house and i'm just marveling at the furniture because there was red leather with the little brass inserts and i saw the mahogany wood paneling and all this just i couldn't believe what i was seeing because i had never seen wealth and luxury of this ever and, and there's it's a tiny little salon type, type room a smoking room or something very small so I tested the door, <laughs> see if I can get out. And to my shock, they hadn't locked it. So I opened it and there was a window and two, two hallways going, you know, a hallway going on either side. So I crept out and I chose to go left. 
because I could see the front door. And so I'm creeping towards the archway there. And I quickly look to my left to see if anyone's seeing me. And there is an old white woman sitting in her rocking chair, a grandma type figure. And my heart sinks because I'm busted. You know, I'm caught. And I could not believe what she did. She smiled at me. And she said, she went, go, go, pointing towards the door. And I looked at her with absolute, to this day, it makes me emotional. Because I love this woman. <laughs> I do. Because she let me go. And I ran. How did you ran, end up there, do you think? In that house? Um, excuse me, why did I end up there? How did you end up there? Like, you, you said you were living in a hut. Yeah, I don't know. I, I woke up finding myself basically being shoved into that room. That's how it started. Oh. And how it ended was me running and meeting my mom and seeing my little brothers and sisters. I was very tall, very lanky, but it was a very emotional scene. It's probably yeah. the biggest thing that happened in that lifetime. Another was a life as a Native American where I was an eight-year-old boy, seven and boy, they treated me like dirt. I was a dog to these people, the white folks. And I felt like a dog too, because you know they treat you like that. Yeah. So I didn't like hanging out in this one street dirt town somewhere I don't know where. Uh, it was the Wild West <laughs> era. I, I don't yeah. know precisely when, but, I, but if I were to go to that town, I would recognize it. Uh, that detailed, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I and I left because I didn't like the way I felt when I was around these people. <laughs> and I went to meet this medicine man, or he's not, he's a Native American elder who was taking us on a spirit quest. Mm -hmm. Me and my two companions were all seven year old boys, eight, and we had to track him. We, he gave us all these little tests, and the final test was to climb up this cliff with a knapsack filled with rocks on your back. <laughs> And I, I did it last. I let the other two go first. I'll, I'll never forget this cliff either. <laughs> I don't like cliffs to this day. I don't uh, Who does? But yeah. at any rate, I did it. And I was so proud. And I love this man. Oh, man. There's a lot of emotion in all of these scenes. So, yeah, how you many, can look through past lives. How many past lives have you experienced when you were doing an out-of-body like how, roughly how many? Oh, and, you know, in, in great detail, but you get glimpses of it and, and feelings and they're, it's always coming to you. I remember the first time it happened, I was probably seven years old and we were, you know, we had left Illinois and we're driving in a camper across the country and we were driving by this used car lot, which they had those triangular flags that flap in the wind you mm -hmm. know they string them up yeah and i'm looking at them and i got this really peculiar feeling like i've seen this before and it didn't look quite like this and i'm staring at them and it and whatever it did it gave me this wonderful feeling but very eerie very past lifey and, and i didn't recognize it but it, i felt like this unbelievable sense of wisdom and different di a different time. I mean, I couldn't, I can't put this into words precisely what I felt, but it really impressed me. And then one day I'm watching TV and it's these guys on Mount Everest, climbing Mount Everest at base camp. And there was a string of prayer, Tibetan uh, prayer flags. Oh. And I'm like, oh, start going. <laughs> like that's it. And, and this past life kind of comes to me where I had been taught. And this is how I think I got a little bit of a leg up in OBEs, because I was taught by this monk guy, a Tibetan Buddhist monk, and with this group of other young men in his hut, we would all sit around and he would teach us, you know, by just talking. I would sit next to him whenever I could. I loved this man. He was funny, and I would burst into laughter, and all the other students would be like, shut up. You know, why aren't you taking this seriously? Oh, this guy's a crack up. What are you talking? He liked me, too. I was, I've always been unfiltered, you That's know? Great. <laughs> but I, I'll never forget that, that memory came back. Every now and then you'll see a certain slant of light, you know, a, a hill, a tree, you know, a flower, and it, 
and you get these scenes it's like gosh yeah. you know i was a norwegian peasant you know middle ages and you know you know that just sounds so authentic because anytime you see people talk about or hear people talk about past lives they were always a, a princess in egypt or you know somebody great so yours sounds so real everyday life you know that it just it sounds authentic yeah funny in grade school they taught us about the australian aborigines that again i had a real strong emotional reaction to that they taught us you know some japanese how to come to 10 and the marigato yeah, yeah. and a japanese song i started to feel that too i'm like not really realizing uh, once I was watching Amazing Race, you know that show where yeah. they took the world, and they took the, all the contestants to Mongolia and had them build up a yurt, and I was crying again. Oh, <laughs> you felt that connection? I'm like, oh my gosh, the way they're dancing, the clothes, the food. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is tearing me to pieces. Uh, and it all kind of made sense once when I heard about the Akashic Library. That was one question. I tell tell <laughs> folks what that is and what you experienced. Yeah. Now I'd read it. I my MO has always been, you know, let's read these books and you know, they're having all these experiences. And if they're having it, so can I. And people would talk about visiting the Akashic Library. I'm like, what the heck is the Akashic Library? And this is a place, you know, the Akashic Plain, Akashic Library, which is, you know, there's according to some definitions, there's the physical realm. The etheric realm, your aura, the astral realm, which is basically where we go when we die, and there's the lower hellish realms, which I've experienced, by the way, Oof. Um, and uh, goes up from there to like the buddhic or the mental plane, the buddhic plane, the causal, you know, they've got their names for it. I don't know. I'm just in the Akashic plane, right? And then like the atmic, the highest, These, this is Eastern religion, right? But there's supposedly a plane or a dimension called the Akashic Realm, the Akashic Library. And Sylvia Brown talked about this. She had a little picture in her book. It looked like the Capitol building. I hadn't seen that at this point. Uh, but I'm like, okay, let's go to the Akashic Library. Because some of these books, they don't really describe it. They're like, oh, I just went there and blah, blah, and it's very brief in detail. And so one day I'm like, let's go to the Akashic Library. I learned how to do this. So you set your intention and you don't say, I want to go there. You know, you say, I go there now. You set the intention and you use willpower. So I did that and I went, Whoa, bam, right up against a black wall. And I'm like, well, there's no way past this. <laughs> what is going on here? And I'm beating against it. I'm like, man, this is, you know, I want to get to the Akashic plane and I'm clawing. Finally, I clawed this little opening into it, a pinhole and this, beautiful divine light silvery divine light hits me I'm like oh my gosh this is so beautiful and i squeeze my way through it and it it filtered out every negative emotion in me it was so cool because <laughs> you don't know it you know you know you might think you're pretty evolved but we all have hang-ups we really do and i left it all behind me and i was like wow i didn't realize i was you know had that much dirt inside me <laughs> And popped out, and it's so bright and so energetic. I could, all the colors were washed out. You could kind of see the colors, but it was so bright and so much energy. I was having difficulty maintaining consciousness. I saw my mom there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. And then I turned to my right and I saw right over a river, behind a river, the Akashic Library, looking very much like the Capitol building of, in the United States. And big and i'm and i didn't feel worthy and i lost consciousness and i woke up so i went back and it was easier and they're like okay you're ready now and i'm like mom can you come with me she's like no 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 you you need to go alone and there was a guide who i didn't see well but he guided me he was by my side left i think took me across this bridge right up to the porch <laughs> where all these pillars are and I'm stopping because these pillars are made of rose quartz and they're translucent and they're emitting light. And I would, I was happy to just stop there and sit on the steps 
and look at the pillar, <laughs> look at the wall. And I would be happy there for the rest of my life. And he's like, no, 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 no. We need to go on. I'm like, no, I want to stop. He's like, fine, let's go inside. And it was this big door. And we walk inside and turn right down this corridor. And there's all these rooms. And I'm passing by them. I can't really see in them. So we, you know, three doors down or so. We turn to the right. And I'm in this little room about the size of a living room. And uh, there are what look like windows or screens, two or three on each wall. And he turns to the wall on the right and says, look at that screen. So I stepped up to it and I looked at it. And suddenly it started, I saw a man there. And I think it was a black man. And I'm like, oh, wow. And I knew instantly that was a past life. And then it was a woman, an older woman. And then it was a child. And then boom, it started going like a deck of cards. All these people of all shapes and sizes and ages and dresses. And, and so fast I could not absorb it. But the message was 100% clear. Like, these, this is you. These are your past lives. And it was so cool because there was a bunch. There must have been 100 or more. I couldn't, couldn't tell you. It was a lot. And then it stops on this one, and it's this beautiful man. And he's bald, and he's got these silver eyes, which are almost glowing. He's wearing a robe. And you know, I've since met people who are, quote, enlightened, enlightened masters. He was, and he was me. This guy was me. In my future, perhaps, this is my perception. Mm -hmm. And he steps out of the screen. I'm now face to face with him. And I am so overwhelmed. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is me. But you know, it's not because it's someone else. But it is me. It's and so I'm like, oh, so overwhelmed. I actually did kneel down. And I wasn't gonna kiss his feet, but I wanted to. <laughs> I did. Uh and of course he he was having none of that. Uh, but I was so I'm like, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. Kind of feeling. Yeah. And it was just so cool. It was so cool. I loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. And it was really overwhelming and I got pulled back. Good. So how many times you went twice then there? Or yeah. have you gone? Yeah. No, I haven't been there since because there's there's a big long list of things to do. Yeah. You know, and every five years or, or so, someone you love dies. <laughs> well, not but you know, it's gosh, it's happened enough. You know, I lost my father, and then I lost my brother, and then I lost, you know, first, my, yeah, I lost my father, my my best friend of alcoholism, oh. my brother of alcoholism, yeah. lost a nephew, recently <laughs> lost a brother. Oh, and no. People, so people so die. And that becomes sort of the top of the list. To, yeah. To explore. Like, with my dad, it took years. Um, but with my friend Roger, he died of alcoholism. It was tragic. Family couldn't stop him. None of us could stop him. And he just wanted to drink, and he knew he was going to die because he was spiraling down very quickly. Yeah. Went from being such a you know fairly wealthy man working at Rocketdyne, wow. you know, an analyzing data and swimming with the astronauts to build the space. Station. And he was very accomplished, a lot of money, very you know very healthy guy, funny. He had a full deck to play with but got caught by this gauntlet of drugs and alcohol that we all, I think, go through at some point. Did they put him in rehabs and stuff and he still? Oh, sure did. He had considerable wealth and lost all of it. Lost his job. Got, you know, his family was finally done with him. And even I, you know, I kind of couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And that's when he died. Uh, so I thought, you know what? I'm going to see him. I know I am. It's just a matter of time. And it was two weeks after he died that I was drawn to him. And he was in the hellish realms, the lowest, one of the lowest realms I've been to. What, what's it like there? Um, where he was, you know, it's different in different places. Uh, he was in a place of complete blackness. Oh, no. uh, there was nothing there but dark black and he was screaming his butt off in terror and anger and sadness and despair they don't stay there forever do they no no you can stay there a long time if you don't you know 
start clicking to awareness or asking for help or at some point it's up to you it's each person your hell is your own making it's not god doing it it's you uh, this is what i've learned because i explored this extensively recently and uh so i'm there i'm in front of him and he sees me and he's like i'm not ready for this i'm not ready i'm not ready i'm not ready you know and he's like help 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 i'm like oh my god my heart I'm like roger you're gonna be okay i'm gonna help you i didn't know what to do i had not had a whole lot of experiences rescuing lost souls yeah since, you know because i learned how to do it oh no kidding but i got pulled back into my body and, and i woke up crying i'm like well this is not good <laughs> poor roger my best friend is not okay and, and so i called you know my family his my older brother was really his best friend but i kind of stole him and made him my best friend <laughs> And I'm like, Stephen, you know, we need to pray for Roger and all his other friends. And uh, I'm, he's not okay. Just send him some love. So I would sit down and I prayed. You know, prayer does work. There's some studies that oh, yeah. show people actually who are prayed for recover in the hospital more quickly. Mm -hmm. And there's some really interesting research on this. So I, with a couple of weeks or a month later, I'm, I'm out of body and I'm flying around in one of the lower realms, you know, and it's up right above this one and it's very urban. It's like LA on a bad day. There's streets, yeah. there's buildings, it's very urban. There are some trees, but not a whole lot. There's lots of shadows and darkness and people yeah. kind of wandering around mm -hmm. uh, who are not quite looking to it. And I saw him and he was behind this barrier. It's interesting because a lot of near-death experiences describe coming to a barrier and they can't cross it. Right, right. And I couldn't. And I'm, and I'm like, Roger. And he's like, Preston. And he spoke audibly telepathically in my head. I love you, Preston. Thanks for all the love bombs. Oh, wow. And I'm like, Roger, you're welcome. How are you doing? He's like, I'm okay. And I tried to get to them when this nasty guy appeared, created a car and tried to run me over. Oh, my goodness. Like, Dude, what are you doing? Because I can fly. You know, I know how to do levitate on the other side. Yeah. And a lot of people don't. And I'm teaching them how to do it. And it's always, they're looking at me like, how are you flying? <laughs> I'm like, See, what, you can't? It's a natural ability on the other side. But it depends on what level you're at. And this is right. a lower realm. So this guy chases me around for a good 10, 15 minutes until I'm like, I'm done. Because I couldn't get to Roger. This guy would not let me get to him. He was an ass. And finally, I just left. And it was some time later, so a few months, I made it to the garden realm. And I'm looking for Roger. And I found him in a hospital. And they wouldn't let me see him. I saw the room. And he was in the room. And he was lying in bed. And they're like, no, you know, he's actually recovering right now. He's fine. We're watching over him. He's going to be just fine. And I was so relieved. And that's the last I've ever seen him. Oh, did he put himself there? Is that a place he chose to design? I don't think so. No, there's there. Because I, I saw my brother there later. <laughs> uh, it was different. It wasn't the same exact room or building, but there are what we would call rehab centers or hospitals. Because some people get torn up by living on earth and they come, you know, they die and they're not okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're in a state of despair or whatever. Yeah, so this is like a healing place for them, or yeah, it was absolutely That's comforting, center. you know. Yeah, it was great. I, and so that was my experience with Roger. And anytime someone dies, I've had you know, the, that whole journey. Like, where are they? Right, right. Um, like with my dad, I couldn't find him for the longest time, and finally, I just said, "You know what? Putting this at the top yeah. of my list, I yeah, need to yeah. know." Because my dad would get angry when we were young kids. For no good reason. And it would emotionally abusive. I'm just yeah. going to say it. And a few other issues that weren't all right. I'm not going to bash him because he was a great father. Yeah, Very no good. one, no one's perfect. I mean. No. He was raised by a single parent, a very abusive alcoholic father who left. So he had no role model whatsoever. And his mom was kind of, <laughs> she was a tough lady as yeah. well.
Well, so he did really well. Very generous, wonderful man, and really got over his anger once my mom passed on. But, you know, it did cause some damage. So this is relevant because I think this was the problem. <laughs> because finally, I'm, I find where he is. And there's this realm that's above that sort of really urban realm, which is like a mall or a hotel is the best way I can put it. And this is where a lot of people will go who aren't quite ready for the garden realm. And it's, you know, depending on what level you're at, it can be a dirty, shabby mall crowded with tables and very much like a mall. I don't know how else to put it. And people are wandering around there and they know they're dead for the most part, but they can't fly. They're not quite working through their issues yet. And above that is a place where there's very nice hotels and marble floors and paintings and fountains and stairs and vaulted ceilings. And it's quite bright and beautiful. And I ended up in a place like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's here. I can feel it. Because you start getting real strong intuition when you do this. Sure. And uh, I'm like, okay, he's around here. <laughs> and, I, and I went up the staircase. I'm like, excuse me, my name is Preston. Do you know a James Dennett? To all these people, I'm like, no, don't know him. And I'm walking around and no one knew who, who he was or where he was. And I come around the corner. I'm like, I can feel him now. I know he's around this corner. And there he is. He's sitting in a little cafeteria setting with three or four other guys. And I rush up to him and he's shocked to see me <laughs> and not ha that happy about it. Uh, and he looks old, you know, and I, which shocked me because I'm expecting you to, you know, look a little younger. But he looked like he did when he died. And stupid me, unfiltered, you know, not meaning to hurt his feelings. I sometimes hurt people's feelings by t being too truthful. And they don't understand him. I actually do love you. I really do. <laughs> And I'm like, Dad, you look so old. <laughs> I regret saying that because he's like, thanks. I'm like, oh, shoot. You know, I'm sorry. She, you know, you know, I just wanted to talk to you. And he looks away. <laughs> and, and I'm like, Dad, I want to talk to you. And he looks the other direction. I'm like, Dad, look at me when I'm talking to you. And, and which is what he used to say to me. <laughs> and that was probably not a good idea because he got angry. And one of his friends got up and ushered me away. I said, no, no, he's not ready to talk to you. And uh, I couldn't get back to him for the longest time. And another time, I pop out of body and I fly to the other side. And I'm in this little room. My mom appears. My mom's evolving without me on the other side to a different person. She's becoming very task-oriented, very elevated, very busy. And uh, she's... She, she taught me love. My dad taught me power <laughs> and self-worth, but she taught me love. So I'm like, and as she pops in the room in front of me, her hair's real short. And she looks like, you know, she's 25. I'm like, mom, um, how are you? Is everything okay? And she said, no, it's not. And I'm like, oh, because that's not what you expect to hear when you're on the other side. And suddenly this tunnel opens up and this guy comes plopping through into a chair and he's completely disoriented and he's real young and I'm looking at him I'm like gosh I think I know this guy but I can't you know recognize him and I'm looking at him I'm looking at him and she's trying to wake him up and then I realize oh my god that's my dad <laughs> that's my dad looking like he was when he's 18 years old and that was too much for me and I got pulled back and that's less I've seen him <laughs> Because, you know, you keep, there's always so much to do. Yeah. But, but boy, it's so cool. Because I did learn how to rescue lost souls at some point, And that became a whole thing. And going to healing temple, visiting enlightened masters. Yeah, you mentioned that, that there's, there's healing too. That Well, actually, in your book, you said that people can heal themselves. Am I right? Yes. Bring an OBE, that there are healings that take place. Yeah, it's really interesting because we all, you know, at some point or another suffer from ill health. I mean, it's possible right. to go through the whole life and be healthy and then die of old age. But right. How, right. how often does that happen? Pe people usually go through one issue or another. Right. right. And it's really interesting because Robert Monroe, he was suffering from this terrible pain in his hip, went out of body, 
taken to a past life and realized he had been struck by a spear. And that's where this issue was coming from. Oh, so from. it was like a residual pain from a past life. Yeah. Ah. And Bruce Moan was suffering from sarcoidosis, a horrible liver disease, which was sometimes fatal and was in his case. He was spiraling down and did the same work. I think I forget what he was taken to, but he healed himself with sarcoidosis. Uh, Albert Taylor had muscular dystrophy, stopped it in its tracks by doing out of body work. Marilyn Hughes, I talked to her personally, had heart issues. She healed herself of a, you know, she shut her finger in a car door, healed it right on the spot. Uh, so, yeah, you can absolutely do healing. And, you know, occasionally I've been taken to heal people two or three times. And it's really, well, here's physical proof of it. Once I was at a party at family's house, you know, we would have dinner every Saturday night. It was just the best thing ever. We'd all come in potluck and did this for over a decade. And we're, we would just talk and play games and stuff. And someone had a battery tester with two leads, mm -hmm. my dad. He's like, did you know your hands give off voltage? I'm like, no, they don't. What are you talking about? He's like, no, 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 they, you can actually test it on a battery tester. And he's like, look. And he tested the voltage of his hands and the meter went up a little bit, right? It was a meter that went go all the way to, it went up like just a little bit. I'm like, this is so cool. I'm going to test everyone's hands. <laughs> so I'm like, grab the leads. And yep, everyone had voltages in their hands. And then I go to my sister, Victoria, who is one year older than me. One year and four days, we were raised like twins. We're very close. And it went up quite a bit more than everyone else. I'm like, well, Victoria, you have really good energy in your hands. Do me. And so everyone's crowding around and they do me. And that darn thing went up almost, not quite half, but, you know, well over twice what everyone else was. was. Mm -hmm. Stephen looks at me, he's like, well, your hands are sweaty. I'm like, Maybe you're right. <laughs> so I go wash my hands and I dry them off. And of course, did it again. And no, it went right up. So there's something about this work that strengthens your bioelectric field. Oh. And you can see this with UFO contactees. Same thing will happen. Sure. Or your death experiencers. Uh, it, it strengthens your aura. So that was really cool. And kind of is attached to all this. And one day... Some of these people talk about healing temples. Didn't describe them at all. Like, there's healing temples on the astral plane that you can visit. That was it. I'm like, well, it's not a lot to go on, but I'm going to give it a try. So I popped out of body and I'm like, no, I go to the healing temple. So I kept saying, you know, I would like to go. And no, nothing, it wouldn't work. And I'm like, now I go. I set the intention. I go now. And I popped into the heavenly realms. And it's beautiful. And I see this building and it's a dome shaped. And I'm like, wow, that looks amazing. And it's dark, kind of not obsidian black, but like dark stone, mm -hmm. perfectly smooth and round. And I'm thinking it's pretty small, but as I get closer, it's, it's a big gymnasium sized building, like a school gymnasium. And there's no doors, there's nothing on this thing. It's just this dome. So I fly through the wall and it's empty inside uh, in terms of furniture, but the floor is so unusual because <laughs> that's what caught my attention immediately is because it was crosshatched like that, you know, with bars going one way and bars going the perpendicular way, like the top of an apple pie with little bands. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I flopped onto it and I'm immediately put on my back, spread eagle. And uh, these are each, the bars are a bit about this wide and they're black and they're they start to move against each other like that. And that caused me to spin around. And this energy was coming out of the floor that was super strong. And I'm like, ah! it's vibrating me. And that's when I look up and I can see the walls. And this is, I'll try to describe this, but it's really hard. Um, I don't know how to describe this. It's a, like iron filigree on a, you know, super intricately carved. You know, like a colander has little holes in it? Yes. A, a, it was like that, but these were beautiful designs. And this divine light was coming through these little holes 
designs and they were layered and they were also moving against each other. So they would create different designs and different light would come out at you. And it was exquisitely beautiful. You could not build this on earth. There's just no way. Yeah. And it was so beautiful <laughs> that I started crying. And, you know, I, I mean, it was too beautiful for me to even absorb or sustain because I start to get this feeling again, like I'm not worthy <laughs> or I don't know how to put this, but it was achingly beautiful. That's a good word. Achingly beautiful. It hurt. It was so beautiful. <laughs> and I'm just staring at it, tears, you know, pouring out of my eyes. And as, as I'm whirling around very slowly, not whirling, but just slowly rotating mm -hmm. as these things are going J -j 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 and sending this light down on me. Finally, it just got to be too much energy for me. And I woke up and, and Darned if I should should have tried to levitate because I bet I could have. I walked out of I was walking on air. I'd been a little bit burned out from a job that I was not enjoying, and traffic that was brutal. Oh. An hour to go fourteen miles through LA traffic, oh. and people are running through red lights and they're cutting you off and they're cursing you and driving on the sidewalks and they're nasty, nasty people. A lot so, of them. Yeah. And work was not, I was having a hard time with, you know, at work as well. So I was just burnt out. And I'm like, I don't care. You all can do what you want. I'm good now. For a couple of weeks, I was just walking on sunshine. It was great. That's I haven't been there since. I was just going to ask you. So you went there once and that was that. Yeah. I mean, I want to go back. Don't get me wrong, but there's always something to do. I'm like, I want to see an enlightened master because people would talk about, oh, there's these beautiful enlightened people. I'm like, I'm not sure if I've ever, hmm, I'm not, I haven't seen that. And, Did you uh, tell me once in a, in a previous conversation that you felt something grab your ankle and it, it seemed to be. Yeah, that's right. That was another negative. Like a well, suction not, cup kind of thing. Yeah, I was trying to get to the other side. And there's this sort of fuzzy, cloudy realm where you leave the third dimension and you go, well, what, I don't know what, I'm using that word loosely. You're leaving Earth, <laughs> this dimension, and you're going up to the next astral plane, right? To the other side. Yeah. And I'm, and there's, it's very cloudy, right? right? And then you hit this realm, and like I said, it's like diving into water, but it's diving into a greater energy field. Mm -hmm. or, Kind of how I, it feels. And I was not quite there. I was just about. Some darn thing grabs my ankle, my right ankle. And I can feel it because there's it's not a human hand. It's got long, sticky fingers, two on each side of my ankle. I'm like, ooh, And it stopped me in my tracks. You know, because I'm booking along pretty fast and boom, I can't move. Something's got a hold of me. And I don't like it. And I'm not scared so much as I know this is not okay. Right. So I reached down, I'm like, oh, this is not even human, which I kind of knew because it had four fingers. <laughs> and I peeled one off, and I peeled the other, and I peeled the third, and peeled the fourth, and it's trying to get back on. And I'm like fighting with it, and finally I got that fourth finger off of me, and I was on my merry way. Who do you but think another... that was? Don't know. Um, Robert no Monroe. Clue. Some of them talked about astral parasites or something um i don't know what it was i honestly don't a negative thought form uh a non-human parasitic entity i don't know i really don't know i didn't look at it there was another time i went met somebody and you know who was also out of body and they had something stuck on them so I'm, i you know i hugged them i'm like what the what the heck is that and i felt down and it was not supposed to be there and i Hold it off. Tossed it. Uh, I'm like, I don't know what that was. Kind of thing. I don't know. Oh. Another another time I just got, pop out of body. I'm like, yeah, I did it. I did it. Yay. <clears throat> Someone asked me, you know, how are you dressed? And I'm like, gosh, you know, I never even looked. I actually dress up in my work clothes. <laughs> I get on my nice shoes and pants. Well, some people, you know, sometimes I'm wearing pretty much nothing except my underwear. <laughs> But and one time I'm finally, you know what? And I undressed and I inspected my whole body. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> Everything's there. <laughs> and it's supposed to be there. And your hands are unblemished. It's really cool. Robert 
Bruce said, if you stare at your hands, they'll disappear. I'm like, no, they won't. I've done this. Let's try it. And sure enough, he was right. And they just melted. Me, and I became an orb. I'm like, oh, because that's your true, you know, you're not necessarily a humanoid on the other side. We'll take that form because that's what we're used to. Sure. But one time I popped out of body and I was walking around the living room and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I hadn't really made a plan. It just, because a lot of this is spontaneous. It just suddenly you're out. Right, right. And I walked through the front door and I'm standing on my porch in Reseda <laughs> and very, very early morning. It's still dark. Mm -hmm. And these three guys are walking down the street towards me. They're young men and they're thugs. They're not okay. Mm -hmm. They're murderous thugs. Robbers, cheaters, stealers, they're not evolved. And they see me and they've they're not unskilled because they can fly. You know, they're floating towards hey, me yeah. darn quick. And I've read about this, you know, earthbound souls. And they say, project love and light. I'm like, nope, I'm not doing that. These guys look too scary. <laughs> yeah. Bye. <laughs> and I dove back into my body. But I wonder more what recently, they would have done to you, like over there. I don't know. I've heard people say that, you know, that they'll try to trap you. Oh. But you, can, you can always go back because your silver cord will take you back or Do they'll you harass you. Can you see that cord? Is it, is it something you feel or is it, can you see it? I never saw it. No. Some people always see it. Finally, I got frustrated. I'm like, I need to know. I need to know what's going on here. Where is this darn silver cord? Mm -hmm. You know, in this book I wrote, I never had the chance to see it at that point. Now I have. Because one day I woke up. I'm like, what is this? This is a huge luminous fire hose that's wrapped all around me. And I followed it in one direction and it went into me. Mm. I'm like, oh, this is my silver cord. Right. And then I did something I've never read about from anybody. I dived into it. <laughs> I went out of body into my silver cord <laughs> and followed it into my body or my brain or my, I don't know I, where it ended up, but it was me and in my consciousness, my mind. Yeah. And it was so cool because it was this big, vast chamber and it was filled with coolest stuff, you know, you know bottles and knickknacks and books and desks and just really cool stuff I wanted to explore. It was all really well lit up with this spotlight coming down, which was my consciousness, my awareness. And then I looked to the side. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this goes on to infinity and it's very dark. You know, I have got a lot of work to do because <laughs> I, I this came to me. I need to illuminate all of this area to become fully enlightened. Wow. And it was so cool. It was so so it, cool. it was a reflection of, of you, your consciousness, yeah, it was, it, it everything. It was my mind. Yeah, it was my mind. It was your mind. Yeah. It was very, very cool. And another time, years later, I'm like, I need to see this silver cord again. And so I made a point of it and I stood there and I'm looking and I'm looking and, I'm looking, and, it, and it appeared. And it was again thick as a fire hose, thick. Mm -hmm. you know, some sometimes you can go way, 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 way far out, and it'll be a tiny little thing, but it's still there. And I felt it, and it went right into my navel, and it was very energetic, and it was made up of. And I'm really inspecting it. And I'm tugging at it, and I'm like, probably shouldn't be pulling on this <laughs> because it, you know it's felt a little frayed around the edges, a little bit. But what I was feeling actually were it was composed of, and almost infinite number of tiny little very thin thread-like energetic tubes. I'm like, this is so cool, but I could feel it. I was physically feeling it. And so that was a little like, whoa, slightly off-putting. Uh, and I didn't want to mess around with something. I didn't know what I was doing. Cause this is again, something I haven't read from other people. So I'm, this is the new frontier. And it's a little nerve wracking when you get to the edge of your knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. In your book, you talk about, will you give, is it three steps for folks so that they can actually experiment with, can you just give them a quick rundown on like what, what those steps are? Yeah. First, I just want to reiterate, it's as safe as sleeping. 
there's no dangers of getting possessed or going locked out of your body or getting lost or anything like that. You have a spirit guide. You're protected. There's a silver cord. You're fine. I would also say that there's, there's only four obstacles to people doing this. One is plain ignorance. They don't know. You have no idea that you can even do this. Another is fear. Fear can be a big barrier. Another would be uh, laziness. Like you may know it, but, but you're not putting the steps forth. And another would be skepticism. I don't think I can do it. You can. Those are the four obstacles. And that's the only thing preventing you from doing this. So it's all on you. And the steps are super easy. And one is physical relaxation. And this is a big step. And this is where a lot of people fail because we're never fully relaxed. People sleep and they're grinding their teeth and their fists are bunched and they're tossing and turning. It takes 20 minutes to relax all your muscle groups. You want to get like, you just came out of a hot tub and you're like, ah, it's, it works best for me if I wake up early, early, go to the bathroom and I come back and I'll just sink into it. So you want to re physically relax till you feel heaviness or lightness or movement or numbness or vertigo even, so sensation. Uh, ultimately, you want to feel a buzzing sensation uh, or an electrical feeling, which might be mild or might be severe. So be prepared. That's the vibratory state. You're ready. But this is a big step. And so it often takes me a long time to do it. Sometimes I just lay down and boom, I, one time I laid down and I'm like, my eyes are open and I'm feeling the, oh my gosh. And I, I'm like, okay, let's just do it. And I did it with my eyes open. It was so cool. But then, you know, once you get relaxed, you do the second step. And this is all about consciousness because we have a stream of consciousness that's always running. We're always thinking of, on multiple levels. We're thinking about all the things we put off. We're thinking about people we hurt or helped. We're thinking about that song is playing in our head. We're thinking about what we're going to do the next day, all our plan. We're thinking, 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 thinking. And it's on multiple levels. And it's running like a race car. And people talk about this. My mind is running. You know, I'm having trouble sleeping. This is why. And so what happens is you're doing this during the waking state. And this, people are walking around in a dream state. They are daydreaming. You are dreaming right now because this stream of consciousness that you go to bed with, you dive right into this stream and you dream it. That's what dreams are. It's your stream of consciousness and you dive right into it. So what you want to do is recognize it, step back a little bit, look at it. If you're really good, you can stop it. But don't, I wouldn't even recommend trying that just step back a little bit and don't attach yourself to it just recognize each thought you're having and let it go let it go and let it quiet down and you can do mantras and stuff which you know say the word love 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 or om om or your name or anything to just kind of stop all these thoughts from racing through your head and you want to get to the point where they you start to hear the voices or the songs or the thoughts, you want to get to the point where you see them. And you can see, you know, every thought you have you, makes a visual image. So when you start seeing those colors and shapes and hearing, like, okay, you're there. Then you go to the third step. And this is super easy and so effective. And what you do is you visualize anything involving movement. And there's a few that work really well, and I've tried them all. Um, one would be to just rock out of bed, just roll out of bed. Another would be to run down a little pathway. Just imagine a pathway, imagine yourself running. Also very effective is to spin like Wonder Woman, spin in place, just imagine yourself spinning or going on an escalator or an elevator or another really good one. Pretend you're on a boat that's going up and down in the waves. Anything involving movement, a swing, all of this works. And suddenly you go, <laughs> you're right out of body. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> very cool. Uh, but there are other methods. You can imagine a pole or a rope above your bed. I've done that. And you suddenly you find yourself reaching up and you're like, oh my gosh. And you pull yourself out. Or uh, another really good method is to visualize a place that you know well. Hmm. Not your house. Well, definitely not your bedroom. You're in your bedroom. 
perhaps your living room, but you know, your backyard, someplace you know so well that you know the details of it. And you visualize it and suddenly it's a picture in front of you and you walk into it and you're like, boom, you're in it. And next, you have made it out of body by just visualizing it. And if you're a beginner and you know someone who's died that you love or are connected to, you call on them. I call this one the love bridge. It's super easy and effective because what you do is you go to bed and you're like, I want to see my mom or whoever. Right. And uh, think of their voice. Think of their face. Think of how they, you know, everything you know about them. Call out to them. And they will come and grab your hand and pull you out. Or they will appear in front of you and you just jump out and then you're there in your room having the most wonderful reunion you can imagine. Or you're, you know, call, call on your spirit guides. We all have them. We all have friends on the other side, every darn one of us. Uh, so these are very effective methods. And there's one more, and this is the key. And if you do this, I can pretty much guarantee it will work. Problem is people don't do it. What you want to do is reality testing and critical reflection. Here's the problem. We're unconscious, or we think we are, one-third of the time when we're asleep. We're not unconscious. We're fully conscious on the other side, planning our days, having adventures. And it's so real. We never even consider the possibility that we're out of body. So what you want to do is when in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, at least three times a day, but preferably 10 or 20, ask yourself this question. Could I be out of body right now? Could this possibly be a dream? And this is critical reflection. Look around. Is everything normal? <laughs> because dreams almost always, without exception, have one thing wrong or multiple. There'll be a window where there's not supposed to be one. The driveway will be facing the wrong way. Someone you don't know is there or something. You're wearing a sweater that you threw away. It can be anything. Once it was a bicentennial penny. I picked it up. I'm like, huh, I didn't know they make bicentennial pennies. Well, they don't. It's a cue. These are cues. Your higher self, your soul is sending cues. And there's one in every single dream. And that tells you what? That you're in a dream state? Yep. And it tells you you are in a different dimension and it's up to you to recognize it. So look around your house for anomalies. Mm. And second would be reality testing. Mm -hmm. uh, because on the other side, there's a few laws of the universe that are different one is you can fly right and things levitate so what you can do is just jump up and see if you float now maybe you're at work you can't do this right <laughs> uh or you can you know what you know people will just say what are you doing They're like oh stretching <laughs> or take a pencil or a pen you know take your pen and let go see it no nope. fell to the ground some or take your finger and try to push it through the wall. And of course, it's not going, is it? And you're asking yourself, am I out of body? Am I no, you're not. Because you know. When you're awake, you know. But seriously consider it because this is a problem. <laughs> you think you know. Uh, but really, you don't. So you need to test it. And if you do this, it's so funny and very cool. When you're at work, I had this happen. And uh, I jumped up and I floated and it all went away. And I was over my bed at home. I thought I was at work and I was not having a good time. <laughs> I was so mad because here I am like wasting my time yeah. doing something I don't even like doing. And I was out of body the whole darn time. But was this after you started getting a lot of OBE experience? Yeah. Like, because most of us can distinguish between our waking and our sleeping time. So you're telling people to do this once they start having out no, of body. No, I'm telling you no. to do it now. Now. You know, because I wish I had known this and I would have had a lot easier time with it. Because yeah, right now you know you're awake. You know right, it. Right. Right. I mean, there's no doubt in your mind. Absolutely. Because you absolutely know this. But test anyway. Test anyways. Try to stick your finger through your desk. Like right now. Do it. Did it go through? No. Oh, no. No. Just do that. I beg of you. Do that three times a day. What will that do for us? 
what will happen is you'll be at your desk giving an interview. And you're like, gosh, Preston said to stick my finger through the desk. And suddenly it'll go right through. And the uh, environment around you will dissipate. And you'll find out that you are on the heavenly realms. And your loved one is standing right there next to you smiling. Oh, or maybe that's why your brother and sister couldn't remember. Because they just did, never did that test before. Had they done that before, maybe they would have remembered. Maybe. I've taught. I did teach my brother Mark how to do it. My sister-in-law, Kisara, she's done it several times. I've taught workshops on this. And I've had people come back after one day. Just they learned the steps. Happened. I had one guy come. Uh, she actually it was a girl. She arrived at the workshop and she says, I already did it. I did it last night. <laughs> you know, because she read the little write-up I did. I'm like, here's how you do it, you know, and come to the workshop and I'll teach you all about it. She already did it. Just knowing about it. This is what I'm saying. The only real obstacle is ignorance, you know, skepticism, fear, right. laziness. You can do this. Uh, and that last step I gave is a key. It's a golden key. And it oh, will I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to just, every time I remember, uh, I'm going to do it. Yeah. What, what I would recommend is say every time you go to the bathroom, because that's something we all do. Yeah. Two or three times a day, right? Or more. Or more. <laughs> um, but at least, you right? You drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> right. So that, and that will give you the reminder. But you can do it anytime you walk through a doorway or just when you remember. Um, that is the key. And I'm telling you, it works. It works. It works. It works. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to do it. But it, ultimately, it's a focus. You, you have to be diligent. When you go to bed, you have to meditate. Five minutes, if you can do it. Because people... Like, I'm a busy person. You have five minutes. Exactly. For Pete's sake, you've got five minutes. Preston, when was the last time you had an, an OBE that, you know, was different or maybe a couple a, days ago? A couple of days ago. Yeah, I what popped was that out. Like? It was cool. Uh, it was probably last week or maybe a week and a half ago. Uh, I popped out and there was a woman. And I, this has been become a big issue with me. I'm now like, if you get good at this, you start getting sort of inducted <laughs> or assigned to cross people over, right? Oh, wow. So this keeps happening over and over and over again. And I don't know if these people are attracted to me or what's going on or if they're being brought. I don't know. But here's this lady and she's out of it. And so I'm looking at her and, and now I know how to, Re, you know, I'm, I test reality, sort of. And I'm trying to determine, I'm, okay, what's your name? You know, how did you die? This sort of thing. I started asking them questions. She's like, I don't know my name. I'm like, okay, this is this is a case here. Uh, and she had a friend with her name, and her name was Laura. She's like, I'm Laura, and her name is Julie. I'm like, oh, I'm like, you're Julie. She's like, oh, yeah, I'm Julie. And she gave me her last name, which I know, and I'm not going to say it. I'm Julie H. It began with H. And it was an unusual last name. I'm like, yay, because people will give me their names and it's nothing that you can look up, right? And one guy came, he's like, my name is Thoreau Dean. I'm like, wow, <laughs> couldn't find him. Uh, one, one time I popped on, there's this little boy. He's like, my name is Buster and I was mauled to death by a bull. Ah. Like, oh, my heart. <laughs> and it just brushed me that I didn't even get to, you know, I got pulled back in my body. So and these were people at, that you were trying to help cross over? Yeah, they're dead and they're, they're earthbound. And I've done this with a bunch of people over and over again. And so this lady, this is just recently, which is why I'm bringing it up. And she's fairly tall. She's got sort of an oval face. She's, you know, I mean, she looks like she looks. It's hard to describe a person, right? She's got brown hair that's fairly shoulder length and uh, somewhat slender and uh, an ordinary looking woman. Mm -hmm. I said, so how did you die? And she says, I overdosed. Oh, she left me lying in a puddle. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, would you like to go to the other side? She said, yes, I would love that. I'm like, I can do it. Grab my hand. And she did. Sometimes you have to convince them, right? But she did. And her friend grabbed the, her other hand. 
and off we went. And normally I can take them to the high, you know, the garden realm or a lower, you know, like I said, that one of those mall or yeah. urban place or a mall or a hotel. Mm -hmm. But no, nope, her friend took over and took her on and they're kind of like, we're good now. Thanks. Why do they get stuck? What um, keeps they, them? Yeah. Um, various things, ignorance. They don't realize they can fly. They don't know where they are at. Sometimes they don't know they're dead. They were murdered or, you know, so, had a traumatic death that was very sudden or it was prolonged or, you know, there's, or they're hooked on drugs or they're not good people <laughs> right. or, or they, you know, they only made it. I don't know. There's all these different reasons, but it's a problem on earth. Yeah. Now you've it's done a lot of paranormal investigations too, right? Oh yeah. 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 Because I, I would love for that to be our next conversation, actually. Yeah, I've done a bunch of ghosts. Because um, I, I needed to know if ghosts were real. This was all for me. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. Because, you know, I've written a bunch of UFO books. And really, you know, it was a personal journey. But I, if I can help someone along the way. And it's kind of my life path. I realized very early on as a young man that this was what I came here to do. And that's sure. another there's so many benefits to going out of body. One is you get to find out who you are, your life path. You can explore past lives. You get to learn all about yourself. You get to overcome fear of death. Oh, healing I love is that. Part of yeah. I got 20 plus cases of healing. You get to fly. You get to meet deceased loved ones. You get to meet- But you've met celebrities too, right? Um, I see a lot of celebrities, but they're mostly projections. Yeah. I don't know. It's weird. Have I ever met a celebrity on the other side? Mm, I don't think so. You know, uh, a couple of these guys. I know I read, I read in your book something about celebrities. Yeah, it's a weird thing. My dreams, always a celebrity. Will, that's my cue. Oh. So I'll, I'll see Lonnie Anderson. or it's Right. Somebody. Right. Yeah. Why am I seeing Ellen? Yeah. Jennifer, why am I seeing Jennifer Aniston? You know, why am I seeing Jim? All these fr people. And, you know, I. it's partly because I'm dealing with that too a little bit myself from becoming more of a high profile figure. Oh, true. Field, so. True. So it's yeah. That makes sense. Path. But could but, we, could that, did you write a book about your paranormal ghostly experiences? Do you, did you write a book about that too? No, I have not. But, oh, but I'm gonna write one about. You know, I'm gonna put out one about my uh, out of body experiences. But I'm gonna write one about UFOs and ghosts and other stuff as well, because I've been on board a craft. You know, I've... oh, I know we talked about that <laughs> in our last conversation. But now you have Symmetry Two that you're working on, and yep. then you also have plans for another book after that as well. Yeah, I'm gonna write about all these out of body experiences, which you know we've been talking for. A while I have not gotten through nearly most of the experiences I've had. Wow, isn't that something? And there's some really yeah, cool. Yeah, it's two hours. Oh, is it? Yeah, time flies. It it sure does. I I mean I'm just riveted by. I I hope we could pick this up again. I mean I would love to schedule a call with you and talk about your paranormal ghostly experiences and how you cross people over in the whole thing. I mean, you know, when you're got, free, I would love to do that. You've got 10 or 20 examples of it. Oh my God. Cool. That's a book waiting to happen right there. It is. Yep. All right, Preston, thank you so much. It's always an amazing experience talking to you. I don't think I could watch a blockbuster movie and be as riveted as I am when I'm talking to you. Like oh, I've gone to the movie theaters, you know, watching some great movie and I would, my mind would wander and I, you know, I would just not be present, but talking to you, I'm here every second. Like, it's great. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. That's very nice to, to hear. Thank you. It's the truth. And I, I highly recommend people read your book, Out of Body um, Exper Explorations, right? Everybody exploring a beginner's approach. All right, there we go. So I'm going to put the link in the description of this video, folks. Please check this book out. 
it, it's the same thing. Once you pick it up, you will not put it down. And it's great because in the back you have a Q&A and you also go into great detail on how to do this. And, and, and if folks are willing to try, there's a step-by-step -step manual for you waiting. So I'm yeah. going to try it and see what happens. That would be what I would leave people with. You know, don't believe yeah. me. Try it. Exactly. I dare you. I challenge you. And you can thank me later because you will. <laughs> Trust me. When that happens, it'll change your life so good. Oh, I'm so, I can't wait. I'm going to follow every step that you have in your book and make cool. sure I'm going to do that. Put my finger through a desk or a wall. <laughs> do it all. Thank Wonderful. you so much, Preston. Thank you. A true pleasure. Thank <laughs> Honestly, you. it's always such a pleasure speaking with you. And we will speak again. I look forward to it. Yeah. Thank you, Preston. <laughs> Take care. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye.